Well, hello friends, I'm David Vos, and um, it's a beautiful day, it's a little cloudy, it's cooled off a bit, I think um, kind of got cold all over the world, but it's a beautiful kind of damp and cloudy day, so I'm inside, thought I'd do a little video because we're on the subject of astrology, Kabbalah, esoteric wisdom. And um, I think up to now a lot of people have been following me and trying to determine if there's a way that they can really prove any of this is true. Well, I think with every new video we do, we get a little deeper. And at some point, if you're following these videos, you're going to come to a stark revelation that you've been lied to. And what I'm telling you is the truth. This video I want to do today is about the book of Ezekiel. Because the book of Ezekiel is beautiful. It talks about astrology in here. <laughs> yes, it does. And it explains who the God Jehovah is beyond any doubt talks about the planets talks about Saturn say where's it talk about Saturn day we're gonna get to that according to this book of Ezekiel Jehovah's throne is on the planet Saturn which is kinda of interesting because I think a lot of you probably wondered about that a lot of you have asked me um, who is this Jehovah right we're, we're is he a real God? Is you know because I've always I've talked about him as though he's the ego, but I've also told you that this is a real person. There's a real history going on here. The Sumerians talk about him as Inki, and sometimes later on he got the name Ea, and this is where he basically those are three vowels, Iau. Um, the Gnostics after Christ died. The Christians later on became known as Gnostics. They called him Eyal de Boff. And in uh, some of the Bible in the Old Testament, he goes by different names. Um, sometimes it is the Yud He Vad He. It's four vowels, but there's only three vowels there because it uses He twice. But a Yud He Vad He. And so that is Yahweh. And sometimes it adds the word El to that, or Elohim. And sometimes it adds the words uh, Adonai, sometimes Sabaoth. Various different ways. When it says Yahweh Sabaoth, it's saying he is the god of, of, an, of an army, a god of warriors. When it says as it does here in Ezekiel, Adonai Yahweh. Most people are completely oblivious. They have no idea what that is. But Adonai is a is a god from Egypt. His he's in the Greek pantheon. He's in the Canaanite pantheon. And there's no question that it's not just a word that sounds a little bit like Adonai. But it is the word. It is the God Adonai. Adonai is the true God. Well, it's the God that we know of as Jesus Christ. And I'll talk more about that. He's the same as Tammuz. In fact, the book of Ezekiel speaks of Tammuz. Tammuz is, a, is one of the months of the Hebrew calendar. It's July. And they celebrated Tammuz being uh, brought up out of hell and exalted in the heavens in July on July 4th. This was the great summer solstice. And um, the weeping for Tammuz was the, the weeping because he saved his bride, which is what Christ did when he went into hell. So, um, there's a lot going on here in the book of Ezekiel. But the fact that the Jews call their God sometimes Adonai, which links that with Jesus or the Tammuz or uh, Osiris, in the another uh, name that they give him 
doesn't mean that the Jews worshipped Osiris or Adonai. But it's just, it's the same thing when they put Elohim in front of Jehovah. As time went on, they began to understand that they weren't worshipping the, the correct God. And they, they, they did a lot of alterations with the name. So it was kind of a revelation. The Jews kind of had this revelation of God. And they never really knew who God was. They, they thought it was the same God. But in, in, in Genesis, sometimes it was El Elyon, the God Most High, that met Abraham. And then, you know, and then a minute later, uh, Yahweh comes down and demands sacrifice. You see, and the Apostle Paul says it was the Father that made the promise with Abraham. That was El Elyon, the Most High. He made him a promise. There was no law. He, was not, he didn't have to do anything. It was an unconditional promise made from our Father in Heaven. But it was Yahweh who came 430 years later and made the law, but did not make the promise void. So Yahweh and El Elyon are two different gods. In fact, Deuteronomy 32.3, as I say all the time, uh, explains how the Most High divided up the nations into 70 and apportioned the gods over them, and Israel's lot fell to Jehovah. That's the way it reads in the Septuagint version. But here in Ezekiel, all the way through the book of Ezekiel, it calls him Adonai Yahweh. Adonai is the name of a Greek god who's also known in the Egyptian pantheon. And so it appears then that the, the Jews didn't always just use the name Jehovah. We've been told a lot of fables, but they had kind of an ongoing revelation. Throughout the book of Genesis, it goes back and forth between seeing the God Most High, El Elyon, it distinguishes between that God and Jehovah. But it's hard to make that distinction now, the way that the thing has been translated, because it's translated from Hebrew, a pictographic Hebrew, then translated to the square box letters of the Aramaic, and then on to uh, two different kinds of Greek, and then into the Latin, and then from there to English, but it's never never was translated into English. This is the problem with our Bible. It's translated into English from the Latin Vulgate, but never from the original Hebrew. This is why we don't know what the Bible says, really. This is why we don't have, when we're reading Ezekiel, we don't know that it's talking about a, a god from Egypt called Adonai. We don't even know that it's there. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses translated... Um, Sovereign Lord. Another translation translates it Sovereign Lord, and most of them just translate it Lord because some of them just take the name Jehovah out. But there's a lot of stuff. I was talking to somebody just yesterday about how the word cosmos is in the New Testament all the way through, means the whole universe, and they just translate it the world. So how are you going to understand the Bible if you're reading the world, but it really means the universe? You see, you have to understand that in the book of Ezekiel, we're talking about Adonai. And in chapter 8, we're talking about Tammuz. And you say, wait a minute, Jehovah's pretty angry about that. He doesn't like Tammuz. Oh, they're weeping for Tammuz. Oh, Ezekiel, look down upon them. Those detestable things that they're doing. They're not keeping my laws, Jehovah says. They're, they're weeping for Tammuz. Okay, and, and so Christians today say... Uh, because they don't understand what's going on, because of the translation, they say, well, um, Jehovah didn't believe in Christmas. That's pagan. Well, you've got your words all backwards. You don't even know what you're talking about because you don't understand the Bible, the languages, and how it's put together. Um, pagan just means the nations. It doesn't, there was no m bad meaning to that word. Heathen doesn't mean anything bad. It means the nations. Paganized. Paganism just means the, the religion of the nations. The only thing about the religion of the nations that was ever considered bad was the fact that Jehovah didn't like them because he was a jealous God. In his law to Israel, he said, I am jealous. That is my name. And I will not allow you to bow to any other God. And if you do, I will murder you. So, uh, he considered these other certain things unclean. 
we get to the New Testament, we find out that Peter didn't know that he had been doing this wrong all of his life because he had been Jewish. And an angel came to Peter and said, why are you calling things unclean? You know, these, these things that Jehovah say are unclean, they're not unclean. What are you talking about? But you see here in Ezekiel, Jehovah has certain things that he considers to be unclean. One of the things is he didn't want you to bow to any other god. And so when he saw them weeping to Tammuz, he didn't like that. So Christians think, well, that's paganism. But you don't understand. Jesus came and said to the Jews, your god is the devil. He spoke to the Sanhedrin. He said, your god is from beneath. He is a liar, a murderer. He's a liar. Jesus spoke to them as, serp, as the serpent did to Eve. He said, you will live forever. You will not die. That I've come to give you life. But Father in heaven who is above is my Father. And you, you don't know him. He's, he dwells in light. And there is no darkness in union with him. But your God Jehovah says, because he's blind, I am and there is none else. But he doesn't know. He is a liar and a deceiver. And he's, he is deceived. It says in Isaiah, your God says that he creates light and he creates darkness. But my father has no darkness within him. Your, your God cursed you. My father blesses you. Your law, it says, but I say, Moses brought the law, but I bring the truth. And the truth is different than the law. And so they tried to stone Jesus for blasphemy. And we're going to explain where that is a prophecy in the book of Ezekiel. This book of Ezekiel is amazing. But as a Christian, you probably have no idea what the book of Ezekiel is talking about. It's talking about astrology with the rings within rings and the four living creatures. This is astrology, and we're going to explain this. But then in chapter uh, 8, it also mentions that these detestable things they were doing was that they were bowing down to the east. And so Christians say, well, see, of course that's wrong. That's paganism. I'll tell you what's wrong. What is wrong is to bow down to, to the throne of Jehovah. You don't even know, because we haven't never been taught, that all of these gods that we're talking about are simply not gods at all. The Apostle Paul said they are principalities, they are dominions, and they are lords. And Jesus came and went down into hell to defeat those principalities, which in the Greek is the word archon, which the Gnostics said was the angels, which Paul says is the angels, and the Jewish religion was the worship of angels, and the commandments of men and a shadow and a type and a curse and Paul says we are under no law because we are the heirs but if you want to be under law in Galatians he says you're a slave have you not read the law it's about slavery so the Jewish God wrote the Old Testament and this book of Ezekiel is very interesting because it's condemning Christianity. Just like the book of Isaiah where in chapter 53 Jehovah says he delights in crushing Jesus. See, there's a prophecy in there. There's a prophecy about the coming of Jesus in Isaiah. Right? Emmanuel. Not, not someone named after Yah. Jesus' name was Eus. It's not His name wasn't Yeshua. But he shall be called the son of El. Not the son of Yah. So, Emmanuel is El with us. And he shall have disciples. And the prophecy's there. But you see, this Yahweh he didn't like him, but crushes him and delights in crushing him and curses him. And in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 28, there is another that, place there where it prophesies of this. It prophesies that this, this is the subject, not only of the gospel, the, the resurrection and the death and the life of Christ, but it's the, it's, the, it's the whole theme of the Bible. 
It's the theme of Ezekiel, it's the theme of Isaiah, it's the theme of Jeremiah, it's the theme of all the prophets. It's the coming of Christ to do away with the, with the works of darkness and the God of vengeance. Yahweh Sabaoth, the God of armies and war. The God of vengeance, the jealous God who admits he's jealous, who admits he's blind. He says that, the, that, that his anger rises up in his eyes and in his fury up into his nostrils and he just, just gets so angry he can't stand it and he wants to just wipe people off the face of the earth and, and Moses has to calm him down and say, please, Jehovah, please, please don't kill us all. This is a wrathful God and in his wrath he comes to destroy with bowls of wrath as he comes up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation with thunders and lightnings and judgments and trumpet blasts like he, like he came on the mountain there on Sinai with thick gloom and darkness and Moses stood back and said, I am trembling and much afraid. But, but you see, our Father in heaven is light and love and only love. There is no darkness in him and we don't need to be afraid of him. We have never, And the Jewish people never saw the Father of our Lord Jesus, our Father. But whoever it is that they saw and heard his voice, it wasn't the voice of our divine being in heaven, our Father. But it was the voice or the, the ten words that came from Yahweh. And it was, it was slander against you and I. Accusations. No one can be accused without a law. See, And this is why the devil is called the accuser. And so in the book of Ezekiel, he stops, starts off by uh, appearing to Ezekiel, son of Buzi. Now, they say Buzi is another word for Jeremiah because the Jews didn't like Jeremiah very much. So they started calling him Buzi. And so Ezekiel may have been the son of Jeremiah. And Ezekiel says, I began to see and look, there was a temptuous wind coming from the north and a great cloud mass and a quivering fire. Just like when Jehovah came down on Mount Sinai in this fire and this thick cloud, this dense, dark cloud, and it had a brightness all around and out of the midst of it there was something like the look of electrum. Oh, well, this is interesting because we're going to see the throne of Jehovah and we're going to find out where it is. And we're going to understand something that Christians have never been told. Where is the throne of Jehovah? Out of the midst of fire, and out of the midst of it, there was the likeness of four living creatures. Let me say right here, there isn't a shadow of a doubt that the four living creatures is the astrological, four quarters of the astrological zodiac. You've got Leo the lion, Taurus the bull, you've got the man, the Aquarius man, and the eagle, which, which in modern astrological charts is usually pictured as a scorpion, and that's Scorpio. What we're looking at here is four animals. See, this is the zodiac. Zodiac is the word zoo in it because it's the the astrological animals. And these four animals represents the four cardinal points on the astrological chart. The likeness of their faces were this. They had the face of a lion, the face of a man, the face of a bull, and the eagle's face. That's in chapter 1, verse 10. And it says they would go straight forward when they would go. Now let's look at verse 13. And as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. You're going to find that in another place in Ezekiel and the 28th chapter. And it calls this, this person who was in the Garden of Eden the great cherub. And it says, you were amongst the coals of fire. Talks about these coals of fire also in Isaiah. These coals that are 
embers or bright shining embers are the planets. So these burning embers is talking about the planets. And then it says something like the appearance of torches was moving back and forth between the living creatures. And you'll see again there's a translation that might throw you. These are lamps. The planets are like a lamp. The moon is always spoken of like a lamp to see in the dark. It's different than a, a light source. The stars are a light source. The planets are not a source of light. They reflect light. They're like a lamp and they shine during the night. So they're not like the sun. It's the light source. And so it's talking about the burning embers which are you know not really as bright as a lamp if you've ever seen a, a coal inside the fire it's a red burning ember so that's the planets these other uh, things that sometimes translates it as a torch that's a lamp and the lamps are going forward and returning so the stars go around the earth they come up on the horizon and go around they go behind the earth and then re they return. And that's what it says in the translation there, that they go forward and return. So that's the stars. As I kept seeing the living creatures, there was a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures. Now, this is difficult to understand because this word wheel should be translated in orbit. You see these burning torches, these embers, these coals, they're the ones that are going forth and returning. See, they're going around the earth. And they come up on one side and go around. And at night they go down the other side. So they're coming and going. And so it says they had a, a wheel on the earth. Or in other words, an orbit that comes up from one side of the earth and goes around. And he was watching the living creatures and look there was one wheel or one orbit beside the living creatures in other words when you look up in the sky from the earth you can see the four animals or creatures or the zodiac and beside the living creatures or within that there are these orbits of these embers um, go forth and return. So they go around the earth and then return. And so if we were to translate this correctly, it would make more sense. And also if we knew what these things meant, because we were in that culture, but we're not in that culture. It's been translated over and over again from different languages and we're in a different culture and we don't understand the lingo. This is the lingo that they used back then. So, and then it says in verse 16, the appearance of the wheels or the orbits and their structure was like the glow of chrysolite. And the four living creatures had one likeness and their appearance and their structure were just like when a wheel proved to be within the wheel. So there were orbits within orbits. Because if, as you and I know today, the planets orbit the, the sun and they, they have rings within rings and they go further and further out and if you go f the furthest planet that you can see out there is Saturn that's the furthest or the seventh planet which is why Jehovah always identified himself with seven and it says and as for their rims they had such a height that they caused fearfulness why that's an understatement because the the vast expanse between each rim or orbit and another orbit is definitely fearful and it, it's, it's quite amazing the distances that's involved. And it goes along describing this and then in verse 22 it says, and over the heads of the living creatures there was the likeness of an expanse and like the sparkle of awesome ice stretched out over their heads above and under the expanse their wings were straight. So he's talking about the expanse of heaven. Now notice it says here 
In verse 24, I got to hear the sound of their wings. Like the sound of vast waters. The sound of the Almighty One when they went. The sound of a tumult. Like a crowd. Like the sound of encampment. When they stood still, they would let their wings down. See, he's talking about the... Remember in Revelation, it talks about the, the great multitude which no man was able to number. And they're in heaven. And it says they, it's this multitude of voices. And they're crying. Glory, glory, glory. You know? So this is this tumult. The, the, the vast multitudes of the beings that live on the stars. That, that clap their hands for joy at the founding of the earth. They live out there on this. They're... they're sometimes represented as the stars and sometimes it's the waters above and the waters are in Revelation chapter 17 it says the waters mean many peoples and nations and tribes and tongues like an encampment a multitude a great multitude that no man could number and so this is the sound of the many waters And there came to be a voice above the expanse that was over their head when they stood still. And the above the expanse over their head there was something in the appearance like a sapphire stone. Well, the furthest ring out that you can see is Saturn. Saturn is a huge planet. And the planet is known in astrology as the sapphire now in astrology this planet is known as the sapphire that's the stone that is associated with Saturn there are different colors of sapphire by the way and it says this sapphire stone is the likeness of a throne and upon the likeness of the throne there was the likeness of someone in appearance like an earthly man there's a man up there. And I got to see something glowing like electrum. The appearance of fire all around inside thereof. And the appearance of his hips and upward. And from the appearance of his hips downward. I saw something like the appearance of fire. And he had a brightness all around. And there was something like the appearance of the rainbow. Or a bow. That occurs in a cloud mass on the day of the pouring rain. That is how the appearance was of the brightness around about this sapphire stone. Well, what sapphire stone? We already know that's the stone associated with Saturn. But you see, it's Saturn that has this rainbow around it, this rings. Saturn has these rings. It's describing the throne of Jehovah as the planet Saturn, friends. And this is the planet that is out there, way out there, in the expanse. So, friends, who do you suppose lives there on that throne? You see, because our Father in Heaven lives in unapproachable light. No one has ever seen Him. The Bible does not describe Him with hair or a beard or as a man. Jehovah is described as a, an old man who lives up on a throne with fire and clouds and judgments and lightnings and you know, there's this rainbow around his throne, these rings around his sapphire throne. But look at Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 1. And it says, Jehovah said to Ezekiel, Son of man, an end, an end has come upon the four extremities of the earth. Now the end is upon you, and I must send mine anger against you and I will judge you according to your ways and I will bring upon you all your detestable things my eye will not feel sorry for you neither will I feel compassion for upon you shall I shall bring upon you your own ways in the midst of your own detestable things you people will have to know I am Jehovah See, he wants them to know who he is. I am Jehovah. You're going to have to know that. 
I demand that you know my name. Now what did he say was his name from the very beginning? He says, I am a jealous God. That is my name. He says that in the law in Exodus. But here in Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 3, he says, he thrust out this idol, this representation made by the hand. It took me by the tuft of my hair, my head. A spirit carried me between the earth and the heavens and brought me to Jerusalem in the visions of God to the entrance of the inner gate that is facing northward where the dwelling place is of this idol that is inciting God to jealousy. You see, well, you see, you see how we think as Christians? We're thinking, oh, well, then they deserved it. They deserved to be wiped out in his anger and his wrath. How dare they have an idol? Do you really think that all these people were all walking around, you know, on their knees bowing to golden images? This isn't what was going on. This isn't what was going on. Jehovah didn't like them bowing to any other god. They weren't worshiping him. See, Jehovah is an idol. He's a bearded man. He has a form. And this bearded man, he has a name. And the 70 elders saw his form. And they heard his voice. And Moses saw him face to face. And Jesus said, you've never seen my father. You've never heard his voice. The voice of the Ten Commandments, that's not my God. But this God is full of wrath because he's jealous. He's so angry. And here in Ezekiel chapter 7 and chapter 8 and all the way through, you're going to see how he displays this wrath, this anger. He's so angry. And, and explains why he's angry. Because they're worshiping other gods. They're not worshiping him. And in uh, verse 14, it mentions that they're weeping over Tammuz. So what is this god Tammuz? Tammuz, or Dumuzi, is the consort of Inanna, or Ishtar. And in the Sumerian legends, he goes down, she goes down into hell. And every step of the way, she loses some more of herself, and she becomes, you know, naked, and she, she's bereft of her feelings. She can't feel, she can't think. She's losing her existence and she's down in the depths of this bottomless pit. And she cries out to, please save me. And so our Father in Heaven saves her by sending the Muzi or Tammuz down there to save her. And so Tammuz goes into hell, down into the bottom of the astrological wheel, into the depths of the bottomless pit, snatches her out of the hands of the devil Capricorn, see, and down there with that two-horned goat, that dragon, darkness and dark forces, has her bound by his law. We're bound in death by the law, by the forces of the carnal world, the carnal laws. And it's Jesus who came into the world and crucified that serpent upon the cross conquered this carnal world and then as the feathered serpent he resurrected his body and that's the sun resurrected on July uh, on, the, on the summer solstice on July 4th they they celebrated Tammuz and his glorification his exaltation in the heavens See, and the women would weep for Tammuz and so it's talking about that, how Jehovah hated the God that saved his wife because he saved his wife from the law, from the carnal forces that Jehovah was putting them under. It was a battle between Jehovah and Tammuz, and Tammuz won. And if you look a little bit further in verse uh, 16, it talks about how they were bowing to the east, to the sun. You say, well, that's idolatry, David. No, worshiping a man with a beard on a sapphire stone with a rainbow around it, that is idolatry. 
like Zeus with his lightning bolt. It's mythology. It's only, it's only darkness. It's an illusion. We, we're going to be set free from that. Christ came to set us free. And when they tried to worship Jesus, he said, Don't worship me. Nobody is good but my Father in heaven. I didn't come here that you would worship me. I call you my friends. For I'm not your master anymore because I want you to know everything I've ever done. You're my friends. You know everything I'm doing. I want you to understand that I am one with my Father as you will be one with us. And the works that I have done, you will do greater. You can say unto the mountain to be thrown into the sea and it will obey you. Just have faith. Only believe. According to your faith may it be done. Ye are gods and the scripture cannot be broken. Well, this is what the serpent told Eve in the garden. But Jehovah, he denied that. And he cursed Adam and Eve and threw them out of the garden. Why did he throw them out if he was, you know, if they weren't, if it weren't true. He threw them out because he was jealous. He didn't want them to know. He didn't want them to gain knowledge. And he cursed them. And Jesus said he was a liar and also a murderer. And so, when it says that they had their backs to the temple and their faces towards the east, it, it's not trying to tell us that these were idolaters. They were only idolaters in the eyes of Jehovah. Jehovah was jealous. But they put their backs to the temple because they, they did what Christians are supposed to do and follow after the Spirit and flee from the devil and turn away from these carnal commandments and these eye for an eye and tooth for tooth and judgmental behavior from these carnal laws. They turned their back on the temple. Jehovah didn't like that. See, that's what Jesus did. Jesus said, your law says, but I say, and your God is the devil. And they said, you're a blasphemer. You say you're God. He said, yes, ye are gods. The scripture cannot be broken. You're a blasphemer. You speak blasphemy. And see, Jehovah's here accusing the Jews that were turning their backs on the temple saying that they were doing detestable things. Jehovah was looking down and he says, see how they're weeping for Tammuz? This is detestable. See see that idol? See what they're worshiping? That's, je that's being, bringing jealousy into my heart. They're not worshiping me. They've turned their back on me. And I'm going to murder them. I'm so angry, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And all the other nations who were also worshiping Christ because Christ was their redeemer and they knew who he was he he came and went into hell and died for them and they loved Jesus and they understood what Inanna was that's the body the bride that's us Christ came here to save our souls Tammuz the Muzi meaning Sida Toth Hermes Osiris, these are all the same person that's in all the other ancient religions. And it's here in the Bible, but Jehovah doesn't like him. Jehovah's pretty angry with him. And Jesus said, when they asked him, you know, when will the kingdom of your father come? When will you return, Jesus? And he said, it will be a sign. You'll see a sign in the heavens like the sun coming out of the east and shining all the way into the west, that will be the sign in heaven that the Son of Man is coming. The sign in heaven is an astrological sign. He wasn't talking about coming on the clouds of heaven in reality. This is symbolic. This is astrology. And so people didn't worship the sun. That's what Jehovah was saying. They didn't worship the sun. They worshiped the light. Our Father dwells in unapproachable light. And Jesus is going to come with, with the sun, with the healing wings of the sun. The sun heals. 
and it gives birth and it brings life. And Jesus brought us life and truth and wisdom and he redeemed his bride. They didn't worship the Son. See? They understood that all of these gods were archons and types and shadows. The only difference here is they knew that Jesus came to redeem them and that they weren't worthless sinners, you know, born worthless sinners going to go to hell. You say, oh, well, well Jehovah will forgive. No, Jehovah says I, he will not feel sorry. He says to Ezekiel, I'm not going to feel sorry for these people. I'm not going to have compassion. It says in the book of Exodus, in the book of the law, when he gives these commandments, he says, um, I will by no means pardon the sinner. Did you know that it says that in the Old Testament? You say, oh, well, no, no, that's not what it means. Well, that's what it says. Jehovah says, these are my laws and you must keep them. And if you don't, I'm not going to forgive you. And not only that, I won't forgive your children for the things that you do to the third and fourth generation. I will by no means pardon the sinner. That's what it says. And, and he confirms that over and over again in the book of Isaiah. When he, when he goes through the litany of all the nations that have sinned against him and how he's going to wipe them out. All nations, man, woman, child, all of them. And he confirms it when, when he went into, to, took Israel into the land of Canaan and he said, I want you to wipe out all these people, the uh, bastard little babies' heads against the walls and kill the men and, and the little children, kill all the donkeys and the dogs and the animals, ruin their fields, cut down all their trees, genocide. But the women, you can have them. You take the women and you shave their heads, you wait 30 days and then you can rape them. They'll be your slaves. This is what Jehovah prescribed. Genocide, murder, death to all those who would not obey him. You see, there were some nations that he knew would never accept his laws. And so those are the nations he murdered. There were other nations that he thought, you know, would, they could kill the men and keep the women and, you know, but it was just more or less war. This is where we learned war from the God Yahweh Sabaoth, the God of armies and the God of war, who is that jealous God who demands obedience or he will kill you all. And this is what the book of Ezekiel is talking about all the way through, all the way through. Listen to this, friends. Listen. Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 3. Now the end is upon you. I must send mine anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways. My eye will not feel sorry for you, neither will I feel compassion for you. For upon you I shall bring your own ways in the midst of you. Your own detestable things will come to be. And you people will have to know that I am Jehovah. This is what Jehovah says. A calamity. A unique calamity. Look, it is coming. An end itself must come. An end must come. It must awaken for you. Look, it is coming. The garland must come to you. The time must come. The day is near. There is confusion and not the shouting on the mountains. Now shortly I shall pour out my rage upon you. I will bring mine anger against you to its finish. I will judge you according to your ways and bring, I mean, he won't just say it once. He goes on and on and on about the calamity and the rage and the wrath that he has for them. I will judge you according to your ways. I will not feel sorry. I will not feel compassion. This is the second time he has said this. According to your ways, I shall do this because of all your detestable things. And you'll have to know that it is Jehovah who is doing the smiting. Verse 9. And verse 10, look the day, look it's coming. Mm, the rod has blossomed, presumptuousness has sprouted, violence itself has risen up into the rod of wickedness. Wow, he just goes on and on and on, friends, expressing his rage. He blows the trumpet in verse 14, which is the trumpets and the, and the bowls of wrath and stuff that you see in the book of Revelation. That, that this God who comes out of the bottomless pit puts forward upon the whole world. Remember, as Christians, there is no condemnation in us. We have passed over from death to life. But Christ Jesus, he conquered Jehovah. 
when he went down into hell, he conquered him. And he set us free from this God and his laws. But you see in the book of Revelation, he comes back out out of the bottomless pit. Now why? Because the Apostle Paul says this destroyer, the man of sin, Apollyon, which is the destroyer, the son of destruction, he comes, why? Because he says, you would not receive the love of the truth that you might be saved because you've been given grace, but you've rejected the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you reject the grace, then, you know, if you refuse to be saved, if you refuse to, to believe his love and, and accept it, and you choose to be going after the eye for an eye and you won't forgive others, then you cannot be forgiven because you make your own choice. Our Father in Heaven is, stands, always stands there and knocks at the door. Jesus knocks and, and, and anyone who will open the door, he'll come in and he'll have supper, communion with him. But if you refuse to open the door, what is there left but a fearful expectation of this judgment that's coming upon the whole world? Because they would not receive the love of the truth, but they might be saved. This book of Ezekiel is exactly the same Thing that Paul is talking about in his letters, the same exact thing that Isaiah is talking about in Isaiah 14. It's exactly the same thing that it's talking about in the book of Revelation with all these judgments and all this stuff coming on, on the inhabited earth from this God Jehovah who wants to murder everyone. And unless you receive this grace and believe that you're not a sinner, you don't need to die. You're free. If you re reject it, what? can he do? See, the, the, the children of Israel signed a contract. They said, yes, we've heard the law, we understand it, and this we will do. They made a contract with Satan. They were bound to death. They must obey or death to you, do you part. Jesus broke the contract. He freed you if you'll only accept it. But Jehovah, you know, he's going to do everything he can to deceive you into thinking that you're still bound by this contract. And so, he says, I'm going to devour them. Everybody. And so, the book of uh, Ezekiel, 7th chapter, is more or less just the threats and the indignation and the wrath of Jehovah as he, you know, he declares this hatred for mankind. Because we would dare, as it says in chapter 8, believe in this this one sent down from the Father to deliver his bride. And you would dare to, to weep for him and, for, and to love Christ. And look for the sign of the sun that will shine all the way into the east. That will bring the, the light of day and the growth and the living light that will give us life. And in chapter 9, it talks about how Ezekiel sees this man with a writer's inkhorn. And he has linen. Well... Of course, the priests wear the linen. And the inkhorn is how they would write. That's a scribe. See, And so he says, basically, uh, remember, Moses was a priest. He was a Levite. And he wrote down the law. And we're going to be judged by this law if, if we don't believe in Christ and the grace that he's given us. If we don't realize that we're not under it. The Apostle Paul says, we're not under this law. Don't go back under this law. You see, this is the worship of angels. It's the worship of this Jehovah, this Demiurge, this Yaldabaoth, the one who says, I create light and I create darkness and I'm wrathful and I'm angry and I'm jealous and you will do what I say. Please don't listen to him. He's a deceiver and he's a slanderer. You're not a sinner. Our Father loves us. But he says, I see the scribe and he's, he's going to put a mark in the forehead of everybody, this priest, puts a mark in the forehead of everybody who is not doing the will of Jehovah. Okay, This is exactly what it talks about in the book of Revelation. You get the mark of the beast. And whoever doesn't get the mark of the beast is not allowed to live. You can't buy or sell or, or do anything unless you worship the beast. Who is this beast that demands worship? This is Jehovah. It says it right here in Ezekiel chapter 9. Jehovah is going to go and mark everybody in the forehead who won't obey him and bow down to him, the beast. Do you want to get the mark of the beast? 
Do you know that it's a literal mark? If you're going to follow Judaism, they literally put the law, their law, on their forehead or on their hand. They literally write it. Have you ever seen how some of these Jews will put this little band on their forehead? Yeah, you are literally marked by the law. You see, in many different ways. According to Seventh-day Adventists, you're marked because you keep the Sabbath. That's some sort of the sign of the law. But it's not just that. You literally, if you're a Jew, you literally write it down on your forehead and put it around a band. They, they write it on their hands with a little bracelet. See, And I don't know that it's going to be literal, but if you keep this law, if you feel this judgment, if you don't accept the grace, then you're condemned. See, Jehovah has a right over you if you accept and sign at the bottom line and accept his marriage contract. See, you say, yes, I'll do this, or death doeth part. Well, then he has the right to kill you. See, men under that contract, these patriarchs, could marry as many women as they wanted. They bought them. They purchased them. Christ Jesus purchased us. He redeemed us. He paid the price of 30 shekels of silver, and they put it into the treasury, and you're redeemed. You don't belong to Jehovah anymore if you don't want to. It's up to you. If you want to go and get the mark of Jehovah, the mark of the beast, his law. See, under this Jewish system of things that we're living in, where these, these Jews run the world and they put all of these commandments upon us and these arbitrary laws, you know, you might there might be an advantage to keeping these laws here now. But you see, unless you are willing to forgive, if you're going to consent with Jehovah and stone your mother, then you see, you're consenting to have Jehovah stone yourself. Because if you don't forgive, then you can't be forgiven. Because you see, you're going to be just as guilty because you can't keep Jehovah's law. Under Jehovah's law, we're all guilty. He condemns us all. The Jews who, who swore to keep his law, none of them could do it, and he killed them all, and he scattered them throughout the whole world, and his judgment rained down upon them. And now, he's still threatening and breathing his threats. But you don't have to believe him. He's a liar. You say, oh, what well, Dave, but, but our Father in Heaven gives us, you know, a different mark. This is a different mark. This is from our Father in Heaven. No, 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 no. Our Father in Heaven doesn't give us a mark. He gives us a seal. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't give a literal mark or a name or a, or a mark in the forehead or anything. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit because, you see, we don't need any man to teach us, but only the Holy Spirit. You need no man to teach you, but the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. And whoever receives the Spirit of our Father in Heaven, which is love and forgiveness and, and, and not wrath and judgmental, an eye for an eye. It's not like that. So you have to be sealed in your forehead with spirit, not by marking on yourself or receiving this law or these ceremonies or this judgment. It's a totally different thing. As Christians, we're sealed with His Holy Spirit. It's a totally different thing than this law, the scribe, this Jewish scribe that's writing down this law that, that binds you. So you see, this book of Ezekiel is exactly in just written in different words from a different perspective. Because you see, the book of Revelation is from the perspective as a Christian. It's telling you, oh, oh here comes this beast out of the bottomless pit that's going to put a mark on people. He's evil, he's bad, he's wrathful. His bowls of wrath are coming. Woe for the earth and for the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Well, who's got wrath? It's Jehovah. But when you read it from the point of view of Jehovah, in the Old Testament, it sounds like, you know, you better do what he says or he's got, you know, he's going to kill you. Well, <laughs> yeah, he, he intends to kill you if you don't do what he says. He doesn't tell you that he's a beast all the time. You know, in the Old Testament, although he does tell you he's jealous and he's wrathful and he's mean and comes in darkness and demands, you know, all this stuff. 
But it's just slightly different perspective when you read it in the book of Revelation and you find out who he really is. The list keeps on going, and we could go through this one verse after another, and we're going to, friends. Because in the next video that we're going to do, because I'm, look, I'm looking at the time, and we've gone almost an hour here, and I haven't gotten but ten, nine, ten chapters here in the book of Ezekiel. And this is important. I haven't, I haven't stopped talking about astrology. This is about astrology. This is a, the basis for what we're going to teach further when we're going to talk more about the numbers and the, the esoteric wisdom and the numbers and the letters so that we can understand the word and how we can cleanse our chakras and how we can allow that Christ inside of our temple to light the candles so we can have supper with him and we can fellowship with him and we can know the breadth and the depth and the width of his grace and his love but in order to get there, we've got to fully grasp all of this to see how all these ancient teachings have been fooling us. We've got to let go of the fear. We've got to stop believing in the devil. There is no fear in love, friends. So I'm going to stop it here, but we're going to come back and we're going to take it up right here in Ezekiel chapter 10. And we're going to go into some more amazing things that will literally shock you Please, friends, if you're having doubts, just stay with me because it's all going to get explained. It's going to take time because the deceiver has put all of this fear in you and we've got to get it out. Not just the deceiver, but all of society. Even your brothers and your mothers and your families putting all of this deception upon you and it's difficult to let go because there's so much around you that's, that's sort of hypnotizing you and mesmerizing you and persuading you. So, this is why we have to spend so much time really unlearning everything that we have learned. But I'm going to close it here. And uh, this is David Vos, and we'll see you guys again tomorrow with the rest of this. I don't know how many videos we're going to do on this. But we will unlearn and remove the fear. And then open our minds to the truth and get that revelation and recognize Christ within us. And then we're going to recognize the authority that we have in Christ and then we're going to move the mountains and calm the sea. It's going to be great, friends. See you again tomorrow.